science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. So put on your safety glasses, do up your lab coat, hold on to your tail. <laughs> It's time for the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. If you're listening to this on the day the podcast comes out, that means Beaker will have tested for level two obedience. So let's cross our fingers that future us got her through that level. We had talked on Pet Chat on the weekend. That's our Twitter show, our live Twitter show, that the snow was melting. Well, spoiler alert, a winter storm has come through and blanketed the area with this slushy snow. Um, it went from no snow to drifts of snow in about a day. Bunsen's very happy about it. I don't mind it. I think Chris is a little sad. And Beaker it doesn't know what's going on because the wind was coming sideways and the snow was coming sideways. So it was a bit of stimulation overload. I just want to give a quick plug for our private Twitter account that we have, Bunsen and Beaker Unleashed. Twitter has these ways that creators can monetize. Um, there's, you might have seen some accounts have super follows. There were some accounts that got paid to host Twitter spaces. They're called the Twitter Sparks program. And there's ticketed spaces. And, and as Canadians, we don't have access to any of that. And I don't know if we ever will. So we went rogue and created a private Twitter account where we can post all of the extra content that doesn't make our main feed as a way to like an extra perk for people that support us. And we've rolled our Patreon account into that process. So if you're at any tier of support on the Patreon account, you have access to our private Twitter. So it's more incentive to sign up for our Patreon account. All right, plug over. <laughs> it's important. It's important to talk about how um, folks can support us. We keep, we keep mentioning it and people are like, wow, we didn't even know you had a Patreon account. And it's good to talk about that. All right. What's on the science podcast this week in science news. We're going to take a look at this type of fabric that they put microchips into that can listen to your heart. That's interesting. In pet science, we're going to take a look at how um, one study found correlation between puppy diet and allergies later in life. Our expert in Ask an Expert is Astro Daria, who's a planetary science PhD student. Um, so this is a great interview. Can't wait to chat. We can't wait for you to listen to that chat. It's always fun to talk about space. Hey dogs, do you know what happens when you spill your cup of tea in space? Well, you'll be left with a crying saucer. <laughs> okay. Probably people have Neptuned us out. There's so many good space puns. All right, <laughs> on with the show. There's no time like science time. This week in science news, it's about a different type of smart clothing. Now, you've probably seen the backpack that you can recharge your phone in. Um, Adam wanted one because he thought, you know, on the way to school or just like, I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know what we were thinking. Um, we just about bought one and we're like, well, he's not going to be outside long enough to charge his phone. Basically it's got solar panels on the back and you can charge your phone just by walking around outside. I think it would be good if you're outside lots. Um, but because we live way out of town, um, we're driving all the time to get into town, to get him to school and to get us to work. Well, except for Chris, cause she teaches from home. Um, <laughs> but this study comes to us from nature and it's about a type of clothing that has circuitry woven into it that is so sensitive it can hear your heartbeat. That's the showstopper. This type of technology has been used sort of in the past. There have been acoustic fibers, I guess, acoustic fabrics that have been created, um, but they don't capture sound. They were, they're made to dampen sound. So clothing or drapery or cloth that basically allows no sound to go through. So it's a way of soundproofing. Great if you are a podcast host like me. I maybe need to put that up in my office downstairs where I've moved to, to record podcasting and spaces when I'm at home. <laughs> Wee Yan is a material scientist at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Where this fiber comes from is basically your eardrum. The team was inspired by the inner eardrum, um, the cochlea, because it's made of fibers as well. So the team's like, well, if we can hear stuff with fibers from the ear, maybe we can make similar fibers to hear stuff from all around. So unlike the fibers in your ear, 
<laughs> the fibers in the clothing is made from cotton. And woven into these fibers is a stiff material called Tuaron. And and the reason why Tuaron is in there, this fiber, hopefully I'm saying it right, is it's really stiff, like the strings on a harp. Also within the clothing at the nanoscale is a blend of materials that are piezoelectric. So piezoelectric fibers, when bent or or I guess rubbed together, produce a current. And that current can then be read by a computer. It creates a voltage. A piezoelectric crystal, the the main place you might think about where a piezoelectric crystal is, is the hammer in some of those um, barbecue lighters. Like you go click and it makes a spark. Well, you're actually smashing the piezoelectric crystal, which then creates a spark, which starts the butane on fire. So these crystals, this this material, this piezoelectric fiber is woven into the clothing. So as you rustle about, any movement, any movement, because it's so sensitive, creates a little bit of voltage. It's a microphone, if you think about it, is so sensitive that it can hear traffic. It can hear people murmuring in a library. And it can even hear your heart beating. Now, what happens when you wash it? Well, they washed it 10 times and it still worked. Now, where might fiber like this be important? Why would having a shirt be a microphone be a big deal? The hope is in the future is that it could be a medical shirt that could listen for murmurs in your heart or anything. If it can hear your heartbeat, it could constantly be monitoring your heart in a non-invasive way. Think of folks that have heart issues or um heart problems, and this would monitor their heart around the clock without the need of anything other than wearing a shirt over top of your body. If you think about wiggly people, like little kids, it might be nice having a shirt that takes data all day where they may not be able to sit still for a long periods of time to have their heart checked, especially if they were born with a uh, like a heart murmur or something, you know, an issue with a valve in their heart. So don't get your hopes up. This was proof of concept. This shirt was basically a patch of fabric. It doesn't it wasn't really a shirt. Um, don't get your don't get your hopes up that you're going to be able to wear microphone shirts and and run your podcast or speak into your your sleeve um, to talk on a phone. But the hope is, in the future, this could turn into something really cool. And it is cool. A microphone in your clothing. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk about skin allergies and diet. Bunsen is approaching five years old, and he's really not allergic to anything. It's been the complete opposite for Beaker. We're not sure if it's the environment or food, but last summer, uh, spring and summer, she got hot spots all the time. She was constantly licking her feet and scratching. It could be the environment. So we, we are kind of leaning towards that. It's the environment. Um, and we have her on a hydrolyzed protein. Uh, we'll see what happens in the spring and the summer now, but it went away over the winter like this. Um, she was constantly itchy, itchy, itchy. And this study because we've dealt with Beaker and her scratchiness, <laughs> the study popped up and, you know, I, I would love to talk about it. So it comes from the University of Helsinki. We've talked about studies from the University of Helsinki before, and they looked at what puppies were fed versus skin conditions later in life. One interesting thing is that the study has a huge database, 4,000 plus dogs, dog parents were asked what the dog ate as a puppy and how it relates to some of their issues today. Now, to make a long story short, it's fascinating. The puppies that ate raw food, uh, tripe, organ meats, um, and even leftovers during puppyhood had way less allergy and skin symptoms in later life. You'd think that people food would cause allergies, but in this study, it didn't. And conversely, of those 4,000, the dogs that got primarily kibble had the highest amount of allergy and skin-related symptoms in adulthood. So they took a look at the percentage of the diet, and if 80% of the dog, the puppy's diet was dry food, that had the highest correlation to skin issues later in life. Like, we do have Bunsen on raw, and he tolerates it, and we did have Beaker on raw, and her, she had all of these skin flare-ups. So what you do is you start to eliminate things from the dog's diet first off if there's flare-ups with the skin. And she's now on this hydrolyzed protein. So the interesting thing will become is that like when she was a puppy, she ate raw food. She had a raw food with Bunsen. 
So maybe we'll, we'll cross our fingers that it's maybe more like itchy grass and stuff out in the environment that she just doesn't, she kind of has allergic reactions to. Um, luckily we live in Canada and, you know, for half the year that's all covered with snow. <laughs> One disgusting extra fact is they found that puppies that ate a small amount of found dead animals or like hunted had a huge decrease in their allergy symptoms too. <laughs> So that's kind of gross. Now, this is just one study. And obviously, do not decide to just change your dog's diet on a whim. Talk to your vet. Talk to people who are experts or who are really knowledgeable about dog diet. Um, That's what we did for Bunsen. He was puking up all of his kibble. Like we started him on kibble when he was young. And he was just constantly throwing it up. Um, He had a very sensitive stomach. And we switched to raw with him. And we really haven't gone back. Occasionally, he still pukes, and then he doesn't like to eat raw for a while because he has, like, um, food sensitivity or food aversion, whatever he puked up last. Here we are talking about puke again. But you know what? That's that's the deal with dogs and animals is, like, you're dealing with puke and uh, poop and things like that. So uh, I, I'll put a link to this study in the show notes because that's probably some something that people are going to want to look at. So, yeah, interestingly enough. Over 4,000 dogs that were part of the survey, they found a correlation between puppies that were fed kibble and skin allergies. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have Daria Pidhordeski with me today. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me. (laughs) And you're a PhD student at the University of California, Riverside. I am, yes. Now, are you are you in California right now? Like is that is that where you're calling into the podcast from? Or you're taking like some you're someplace else in the world doing your courses through? the University of California, Riverside. So I am currently in California. I'm currently living Mm. in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm in my apartment right now that's in North Hollywood. And it's a rainy day here, which is not usual. (laughs) Not usually rainy. No, never. (laughs) Well, there you go. Uh, It was actually raining yesterday uh, or a couple days ago in Alberta, Canada, but it instantly turned to freezing rain. And that was a bit of a sketchy scenario. (laughs) Sketchy scenario. That's worse. Um, Have you lived in California your whole life or are you there just for your PhD schoolings? I'm just here for my uh, PhD schooling. So yeah, I moved here to start my program in August of 2020 Mm -hmm. and uh, I love it here. I don't, I don't think I'll want to up and leave immediately when I'm finished with my program. I I really, I really like Southern California. (laughs) The weather's nice. It is <laughs> usually. <laughs> usually, there you go. <laughs> um, now, I mentioned you're a PhD student. Could you get into a little bit about what you're a PhD student of? Because yeah, that is is very exciting for us to talk to you today. Absolutely. So formally, I'm in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UC Riverside. Um, So the department encompasses a lot of different types of, uh, you've got your geologists, geochemists, um, and then just like more like kind of astrophysicist type planetary science people. So I specifically kind of fall into the uh, planetary science uh, part of that department. And I do, I study astrobiology. Um, And specifically within astrobiology, my research focuses on exoplanets. So to kind of explain what those things are. So astrobiology is the study of the search for um, extraterrestrial life outside of Earth. Um, So we've never found life on any other planet. We've never found, we've never found simple life, like even at any type of microbial or bacterial life. 
Um, we've never found complex life anywhere else. So it's it's all about this search for understanding, is there life somewhere else? Where might that life be? And how can we detect it? Um, and then specifically, I study um, astrobiology um, in reference to exoplanets. So all of my research takes place on objects that are outside of our solar system. So none of the planets in our solar system, I don't, I don't work on those. I work on all the stuff that's really far away. <laughs> Nice. All right. So I've got one one big question is this is a in, uh, pretty intense journey that you're on to get your PhD. What got you into science in the first place? Like you're like you're obviously very invested in space, too. Yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, yeah. I'm just curious what got you hooked so, into the science yeah. to start with. Yeah. I've always loved science from the earliest age that I can remember. Um, I just always have been fascinated by it. My mom is a nurse. My dad is a doctor. So they kind of have that, like the life science uh, side of things were influencing me. And when I was younger, um, but I honestly, I grew up in this really small town on the Eastern shore of Maryland and I was an only child and it was just my mom and I, and, um, there I was, you know, I was alone a lot. I didn't have, uh, any siblings and I spent a lot of time by myself. And during this time is kind of when I found the internet. Um, I'm kind of like a child of the internet. I grew up, <laughs> you know, on YouTube and then watching videos and, and doing all these things. And that's kind of how I found outer space. Um, so like from the, from a very young age, I remember like watching YouTube videos about like black holes and just different, you know, um, just crazy things in outer space. Um, and as I grew up, you know, I always thought space was cool, but it's kind of like some people, some people were related to like dinosaurs. Like you think they're, you think that it's cool when you're a kid, but then you just kind of grow up and grow out of it. But then there's like that small subset of people that continues to study <laughs> them forever. Dinosaurs um, are so cool though. They're so cool. I think they're <laughs> so cool. Um, yeah. So I kind of, you know, I strayed away from it a bit. I was in this small town. So I went to college uh, where I was growing up because I supported myself through school. And because I was at a small school, we didn't have like astrophysics or astronomy or anything. Um, I took a really awesome AP biology class when I was in high school that made me know that I was going to major in biology. I thought that the study of life itself was so fascinating. Um, so that's kind of what I pursued. I majored in biology. I minored in chemistry when I was an undergrad. Um, I, I loved it all. I love those classes. I love lab sciences. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and then right when I was about to graduate, this class opened up called astrobiology. And it was the study. I, I'd never heard of this word in my life. And I, I was <laughs> reading the course description and it said it was the study of life outside of earth. And I'm like, this is literally my two favorite things, the study of life <laughs> and outside of earth and combined. Like I, I, I was mind blown. I still to this day, like remember reading that course description and being like, Oh my gosh, I have to take this class. <laughs> and it all just came right from that, that one course. And I, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was the ultimate crossover and you had to see it. Absolutely. It was so <laughs> crazy to me. It still is. You know, it, I can't believe that a field exists that's so perfect for the things that I've grown up just being fascinated by. Aw. <laughs> that, I, I love that story. I got goosebumps with you talking about just how inspired and excited you, you were when the, when your, your niche opened up or niche, depending on where you are in the world. Um, <laughs> so you study now or you're studying or your PhD studies are of astrobiology. A couple, you mentioned what it is. Uh, now the other question is if you study astrobiology, you're studying life that's not on earth. How do you go about trying to find it or test it? <laughs> yeah. Great question. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's a lot of subsets to the field of astrobiology. And, um, so basically, um, there's just kind of different types of, so there's, um, there's lab scientists, there's like people who work. So yeah, you're, you're in the lab. There's, um, kind of computer scientists, like modelers that do all of their work through that kind of thing. And then you also have observational astronomers who are like using telescopes and, and doing that. So, all of this to say, like there's multiple categories and within them, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. So lab scientists is typically people who kind of studied like biology or chemistry um, in undergrad or whatever, 
that's not the route that I continue to go down. But what they can do is um, you can simulate Earth-like environments in the laboratory. And you can kind of run tests to see, you know, how life could form under certain conditions. And then you can also um, work with, so something that we're doing right now that's coming up in the next 10 years or so that we're really excited about is all these sample return missions, right? So we Mm. sent this rover to Mars recently. And so there's instruments on this rover that are performing like tests on, you know, the surface materials that it's collecting through uh, even like gas chromatography, you know, there's, there's different, um, like, the same types of machines that you see uh, in like a chemistry lab, you have on these rovers and these objects that are, are going to these other planets. So you have people in the labs that are like, working to create those that, you know, that kind of stuff, test that. Um, that's like a huge kind of section of astrobiology that's really, really important. I also think it's one that's very kind of underlooked. A lot of people when they're majoring in biology or chemistry don't realize that they could work for NASA and do, you know, research about that (laughs) kind of stuff. Um, So I'm more of a, I do, so like you said, like, how can you test that stuff? So when these objects are really, really far away and we can't get to them, kind of like these exoplanets, it's all about um, creating models and running theoretical simulations. So you're saying, okay, let me input all of these these parameters and say, you know, if this planet is like this, what are the chances that there could be life? What would that life look like? How could I detect that life? And you're simulating observations and you're using that to help as we are kind of moving forward in uh, creating more advanced technology that can actually do these observations. We need to start testing very early on, you know, how how powerful does this need to be? How big would this telescope mirror need to be? And it's kind of like, I do a lot of that type of, of science of saying, okay, if we wanted to detect life on this planet, here's exactly what we would need. And here's mm. what it would look like. And here's how much it might cost or something like that too. And then of course uh, you also have, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm just, yeah. I'm just super interested. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, no. So like the third, I guess, kind of group is like observational astronomy. So people who literally, you know, use telescopes to do the actual observations. So I'm doing a lot of theoretical simulations. And then there's people that are doing observations with things like the Hubble Space Telescope that's in space or ground based telescopes like the Keck uh, telescope in Hawaii. Um, And so you have uh, that job, too. So those (laughs) those uh, are people that are probably working like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., you know, 4 a.m. to 10 (laughs) a.m. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's all kinds of different stuff, lots of different types of scientists uh, and lots of different ways to test for it. So within our solar system, we can kind of actually go there. We can send objects. We can send rovers, probes. When we're talking about exoplanets, it's all too far away and it's all theoretical. Hmm. Yeah. So the big follow-up question to the testing and the planning is evidence or ideas do do the astrobiologists like yourself are there are there candidates out there are there hunches out there or or is or no i don't know yeah so right now what we're in this kind of era right now um so we're we are actually about to launch the most powerful space telescope of human history into space on December 22nd. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. So up until this telescope launches, the most powerful telescope that we have um, been able to observe planets with is the Hubble Space Telescope. And then other type of planet finder probes that have launched, such as um, there's like the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite called TESS. So these are all like smaller kind of like satellites. And what they can do is what we can what we can do really well right now is detect planets. We can find planets that we think might be Earth-like, and that's all based pretty much on their size, so radius and mass measurements. So we kind of uh, narrow down categories of you know planets that have been detected and say, okay, well this one's close to Earth's size, which is a a good starting point. Um, but right now, before prior, you know the this is hopefully going to change in the next few months as the James Webb Space Telescope launches. But what we can't do right now is what we, we really can't um, characterize a planet, an Earth-like planet's atmosphere because they're too small, they're too far away. We don't have the technology, the capabilities to do that right now. 
So right now we can't, you know, point a telescope at an Earth-like planet and say this has life on it um, because it just requires better technology than we have. And by that, it just means a bigger telescope, a bigger mirror. So you basically, the, t- the, collect- the size of the mirror that's of the telescope that's launching in, uh, at the end of this month, it's like three times or two and a half times the size of Hubble. So it's huge. It's, it's literally the biggest thing we've ever put into space. We had to, SpaceX had to create a rocket that was large enough to fit this telescope. Um, hmm. And it's all folded up and it's all, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you should definitely look into it if you've never seen a picture of it. it it's huge. I saw it in person. So. Oh, you saw, said, you saw it in person. <laughs> I wow. did. Yeah. I got to go to Northrop Grumman and see it and I wasn't allowed to take pictures, but it was so cool. Can you give so, us a relative size? Like I know, I know that I can, I know the dimensions if I was to Google it. Like I, I don't know them exactly, but. So it's six and a half meters. Right. So, yeah, is the collecting size of the mirror. Right. So six and a half meters is easily the size of a room, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's huge. It's so tall. Like uh, people, there. when you take a picture next to it, like you, it looks like you're like the size of like a dog and the, <laughs> the telescope is the size of like a building. Like it's, it's just, it's huge. You know, it's, it's like, it's so, you're like awestruck. So yeah, so you point this thing at the planets and what you're looking for, you're looking, you're you're pretty much probing their atmospheres and you're looking for signs of life or signs of habitability. So you want to find you're you're looking for water, you're looking for, you know, oxygen, um any type of like fluctuation in um the presence of maybe even like greenhouse gases like methane or CO2 um just anything that might give signs to an atmosphere that could potentially be habitable uh like nitrogen and you know all these uh, these things that we see here on earth so you're pretty much uh your you know the atmosphere kind of holds the the keys and the the answer behind what's kind of going on on the planet. So I, I study uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets specifically. Hmm. And then there's always the, well, maybe, I mean, you're the expert. Um, mm-hmm. There's always the, the debate that there could be life that doesn't need any of that, that is alive. This is true, but I guess the way that we kind of think of it is that the we, you know, based on the fundamental the fundamental laws of physics state that they are the same everywhere in the universe. And okay. so we kind of assume that um we kind of we kind of take that approach in this sense. But the right. other thing is like even just narrowing down like an earth-like planet like we don't expect life to really exist on, you know, a gas giant, a planet that doesn't have a surface. If it could exist on it, it might be, it might be something like bacteria or whatever, but you know, we're kind of, we're thinking about this in the sense that we're interested in finding intelligent life. Mm. Yeah. And it's tough if it's a crushing planet with no surface. Uh, Yeah, uh, exactly. (laughs) So, and Um, also it's just the presence of water. No, go ahead. Oh yeah, just just the presence of liquid water, and so you can't have that on a gas giant. You need to have a terrestrial planet, so it has to be small enough. Is this where the Goldilocks theory comes from? Like you got to yeah. be within the sweet spot around the star. So the the yes, that has to do with the presence of liquid water. Absolutely, and yeah, not too hot, not too cold. The Goldilocks <laughs> zone, or also the habitable zone, is what we call it. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope has been under development for about twenty years now. It's mm. been delayed time again and again and again so its original design funny enough you know the first exoplanet wasn't discovered until the 90s Mm -hmm. so when this um when the web telescope was being designed exoplanet science was not its priority or (laughs) or well exoplanet science was but earth-like exoplanet science not necessarily right so it's a lot easier to detect to detect exoplanets that are bigger, so like hot like these Jupiter type, you know, size mm-hmm. planets. And so I think that back then they were interested in, in in understanding more about the statistics of exoplanets, but not necessarily characterizing Earth-like worlds. We weren't exactly there yet. So it's going to provide a lot of really great information for us who study Earth-like planets, like us astrobiologists. But what we are the most excited about is uh, in the 2040s, 
Um, it was originally announced. So every 10 years, the National Academy of Sciences does the astrophysics decadal survey where they uh, set the priorities for the next 10 years of astrophysics and their priorities uh, basically decide where the money goes. So the 2020 astrophysics decadal survey, it was delayed because of COVID. So it just, the outcome of that survey just uh, became released last month mm -hmm. and they recommended a telescope that is designed specifically to study the search for life on other worlds. And it's, it's, it's massive and it's a, uh, IR, uh, infrared, ultraviolet, optical, you know, very large wavelength spanning uh, telescope that is planned to launch for the 2040s. And it has the type of technology that we are really needing to do this work. And so that's what we are all very excited about. Okay. So you uh, look, working in the lab on your theory, this would be the telescope that you would dream up to answer your questions. Exactly. Yeah. So the simulations oh, okay. I do, a lot of them are based specifically for this telescope. Yeah. It's called Louvoir. Well, I'll be excited too. I'll be an old, older man by then, but I'm, I'm, I know you're a little, you're younger than me. So that's going to be super <laughs> exciting for the, the younger scientists just starting on this. You get that wicked awesome telescope by then. And who knows how much technology will advance by 2040, right? That's a way. Right. Away. Yeah, hmm. exactly. Do you, this is philosophical uh, and it wasn't in the questions I sent you. Um, <laughs> Do you, do you, do you sit awake at night and think about life on other planets sometimes? Like, does that, is that part of your drive? Like a sense of wonder? Do Absolutely. You, do you picture other creatures, what they might look like and how they might be and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I think it's impossible not to. It's really cool that it's, it's my job to get to do that. And it all came from this, uh, you know, original thing that the fact that it was something that kept me up at night and I would think about it all the time. And I talk about it way too much and I want to ask people <laughs> all the time what they think. I, I love to speculate. I, yeah, right now it's, it's more of a, yeah, it, it's a curiosity in, in what that might look like. But right now, I guess it's more like I really just want to figure out how we can prove it without a doubt. You know, mm -hmm. I I want to I really hope that that happens in my lifetime. I'm very. It's just I don't know. Sometimes there's there's you know, there's nights I'm laying there where it feels like it's never going to happen or it feels so much farther away. And then there's other nights where I have been doing really exciting research for the days prior or whatever. And I feel like, OK, like this is you know, this is all meant to be, it's all going to fall into plan. We're going to, we're going to figure it out. So yeah, I, um, I am very driven by just a fascination of the, of astrobiology as a whole. And I just knowing now and being so aware of how many planets there are, it's hard to imagine that we're the only one with life, but it's at the same time, I don't know. It is a lonely thought to think that we're the only uh, life in this entire universe. And just to your point, I get it because I've talked about stories on the science podcast um, where it's turned out it wasn't true. Like they thought there was life on Venus from some phosphine gas or and life on Mars, but it's turned out both have been kind of inconclusive or not true. Exactly. And I had I have been following those stories very closely. And yes, <laughs> you're right. It it and the media just blows it out of proportion. Oh, yeah. and well, that's my fault. <laughs> I'm part well, of that. <laughs> no, it's not. The news outlets, the article, the it's it's always the titles of the articles. It's it's they need they're. Mm, I could go on, and I just don't need to. <laughs> like life on life on Venus, and then exactly, and like and then you read the maybe. article, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, and and you know, and you know, everyone takes that and runs with it. Yeah, it's it's well. I think we can both agree that if there was life found on another planet or holy cow on another planet outside our solar system, that would change society forever, right? Wouldn't that be one of the most profound things ever in the history of humanity? Yes. Everyone with main character syndrome would just lose their minds. <laughs> yeah, it would be, like you said, change the fundamentals of, of yeah, the human history Every forever. Everything. In the course of the future of the universe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're we're not alone. We're not the center. Um, right. I, I wonder if you'd get more funding. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
This has been a fascinating discussion about astrobiology. Thanks for sharing that about your studies. And um, we'll follow you, like we follow you on Twitter and we'll follow what happens with all of this, especially when web launches um, and the data that gets back. But we have a couple standard questions that we ask. And one is a pet story. Um, we ask our guests to share a pet story from their life. Could you, could you do that with us? I can. So I, this is probably not the best pet story you'll ever have, but it's just the one that I always think of. And it's kind of like a defining time in my childhood. Um, so I, like many others, probably my very first pet that was not a fish was a hamster. Her name was Sandy. She was the coolest hamster ever. Seriously. Like I, she lived way longer than hamsters were supposed to live. And every hamster that I got after her was just not the same. So she was my first real kind of pet and she was awesome. We never had any issues. And one, one night, uh, like many other hamster owners have probably experienced, uh, Sandy got out of her cage. <laughs> and so when I went to go, you know, pick her up the next morning, she was gone. Um, so of course I'm super young. I'm devastated. It's my mom and I, we live in an apartment and we're like, oh my gosh, where is this hamster? We spent the whole day looking for this hamster. We have no clue at this point, you know, where, where she could possibly be. And I don't remember whose idea it was, but that night we decided to uh, leave out a trail of, I'm pretty sure, I really think it was Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It was some <laughs> type of cereal. We left the trail out and we're like, okay, you know, where if, if she's alive or if she's here, we'll, we'll, you know, maybe she'll come finding it. And uh, so we left the trail out. We went to bed the next morning. We woke up and it was gone. The trail of Cinnamon Toast Crunch was gone, eaten completely. She had eaten it, but it was great because we knew that she was there. Uh, long story short, we used the same method and we finally <laughs> found her. At this point, she was underneath of a TV stand and she crawled out and we caught her. But <laughs> yeah, we that is, is a very, very fun childhood memory. And so if you ever lose your hamster, leave out a trail of cereal or something. And Cinnamon Toast help. Crunch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is my son's, my youngest son's favorite cereal, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's um, mine too. <laughs> oh yeah. I love yeah. how they've changed the Cinnamon Toast Crunch into like these, they look deranged and they're constantly licking each other. And you're like, wait a second, <laughs> aren't, isn't that cannibalism? Like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a goofy cereal. Um, <laughs> well, I'm glad your pet story had a, had a happy ending. Uh, even if though it was a little wacky. What was that? What was the hamster's name again? Sandy. Sandy. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I think I named her after Sandy from SpongeBob. Sandy Squirrel. I was going to ask yeah. if there, I was going to ask. <laughs> yep. Pretty sure. <laughs> Sandy Squirrel. There we go. No spacesuit though, but you are, I mean, you are working on space now, so it's all tied oh, together. Wow. Look how full circle that is. I didn't even <laughs> realize it until today. <laughs> uh, the other question we ask our guests for on the, on the podcast, our standard questions, is the super fact. It's something that you know that when you share, it kind of blows people's mind away a bit. Um, and like this is a, I mean, not that I'm saying you haven't blown my mind away. You have. Did you save a super fact for us? I did. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I think this is this is a very basic one, but I it's just it, to me it is one of the most profound. So obviously when you, so a lot of people will say, uh, there's more grains of sand on the earth than there is stars in the sky. I don't really, I think that's, that's kind of crazy, but I don't know. That doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. I can't, cause I can't really fathom how many <laughs> grains of sand there are. But when I think about the night sky, I'm like, okay, the night sky, there are so many stars and there's only so many stars that we can even see. Um, so the fact that I think is crazy is that Every you you go outside at night and you look at those stars. Every single star has probably has at least one planet around it. And I think that that's crazy because there are other systems, there are other stars and planets that have there are, there are other there could be other multi-planet systems out there just like ours. You know, stars with with six or seven planets. So we look at them. We we look at the sky. We see the stars. We don't see the planets. So sometimes we don't think about the fact that they exist. And I just think that that's crazy. <laughs> so planets are the norm. Like it's normal to have planets around a star. Yes, it's normal to have more than one. More than one. 
And, and we can only see the biggest ones right now, right? The giant ones. There, There is a detection bias towards the larger ones, yes. We can okay. find the smaller ones. We're just finding less of them because it's easier to find the bigger ones. Gotcha. Hmm. That is, that's wild. Every yep. star could have a, like a, a solar system like ours or similar that we just don't exactly. know yet. We, exactly. But, but they at least have one planet or more. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Most of them, yeah. Yeah, we know now through statistical measurements from the Kepler Space Telescope. That is cool. There's there's a – I've talked about this before on the Science Podcast. And um, in, in Alberta, there's a game company called BioWare, and they made this game called Mass Effect. I don't know if you've heard of the video game Mass Effect. I have, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know the, much about it. Yeah, so the cool thing that people love about Mass Effect is that your, your little – your spaceship that your main character is in control of – it goes from star to star to star, and all of the stars have planets around them, um, ranging from terrestrial to gas giant, and they all have names. So it's like in the future. It's a lot of naming of all of the different planets. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. That is a super fact. I love it. People who are driving might have to pull over and just ponder their existence after that. They should. <laughs> <laughs> I know I will. <laughs> you will? Okay. <laughs> the last section of the podcast is... Uh, one where we get to know our guests a little bit more and they talk, the guests can talk about hobbies or causes, something that's important to the, to them. And you wanted to talk about mental health. Um, what did you want to chat about with that? Yeah, I just, I kind of just want to bring awareness. Um, I think that um, it, it feels like it's only been in the last couple of years that people started being really open about talking about mental health, specifically on social media. I feel like I grew up in kind of a generation where it was really taboo. It wasn't something that you were ever asked about. It wasn't really something that kids talked about with their parents either. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've grown older, I myself have been really affected by both depression and anxiety. Um, I, you know, I kind of always thought that I, I always felt really alone in this up until I was probably in college and even the last few years where I felt like I started seeing more people talk about the fact that they experienced depression and anxiety too. Um, and that it's, it's normal, uh, and that it's, it's, you're not alone. Um, I think another thing that's really important to note is that the, the levels of depression and anxiety in PhD students is, uh, no pun intended, astronomical. Hmm. Um, we go through so many hidden things that people don't see. And I've just, I've read a lot of even scientific studies that have occurred over the last couple of years that talk about how the rates of, you know, depression and anxiety in PhD students are probably like 60% higher than people that are not in these programs. Um, and I don't really necessarily always feel like the people in my PhD programs, like we're sitting around and kind of talking about that. Uh, on top of all that, we just, we are, we are living in a pandemic, um, and it has been going on for, for years now. And there is so much, you know, mental health associated with that. Um, we're all kind of going through it. And I just, I want to, you know, bring awareness to the fact that scientists, go through this stuff too. Um, people who look like they have it all together on the outside, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, you're only seeing a slice of what people decide to put on the internet, but you're never really getting the full picture. Um, I think it's really important to reach out and get help if you need it. Um, it's always you know, easier said than done. There's a lot of services that aren't always available to everyone, but I think it's really important to take the step in getting the help you need in whatever way that looks like for you. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, it's not something that scientists really talk about a lot where we're kind of thought to be more like logical, you know, type A people, not necessarily very like emotional and, and driven by that part of our, uh, of our, you know, thinking. Um, so I just think it's kind of important to introduce that into this realm of science. You know, it's, it's, there's other things going on too that are important. Um, guests like yourself openly talking about either struggles or where people can get help. Um, we had Susanna Harris. I don't know if you're familiar with Susanna Harris who run, who started PhD balance. I don't know if that rings a bell. Um, we talked to her yeah. and she, she mentioned also how important mental health was with grad students and PH students. Uh, so it's, yeah, any students, of course. Any student, yeah. any student. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So that is important to talk about mental health. Um, do you have any advice besides talking to, like from your own, your own life? Well, always the number one thing is, is talk to someone. It's don't, if you're feeling any, if you're, if you're feeling, you know, if it's, whether it's, it's, you're thinking about harming yourself or someone else or, or worse than that, tell someone, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a professional to start with. If you can't get to a professional, find a friend or a family member that you trust or, or something. Um, don't, don't ever keep this stuff bottled up inside. It's, it's always important to talk to someone even if you feel like you don't want to talk about it, you would be so surprised uh, how much just taking that first initial step can help you. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, don't feel guilty about it. It's not your fault. This is, um, you know, like in, kind of, you know, take care of yourself, put, tell yourself that you matter. It's, it's, you know, not something that you should just kind of brush off. Uh, these, you know, these feelings are important to check up on and yeah, just literally just talk to anyone and see where that conversation goes, but don't keep it bottled up inside. What good advice. Uh, and, and I believe a hundred percent of what you're saying is true. Like there's been for decades, my generation is a little older than yours and my parents' generation is even older and nobody talked about mental health. Like um, you suck it up. Buttercup was kind of how it worked with uh, if you were a male and, you know, hide it away. If you, I guess like nobody talked about it, right. It was taboo. Yeah. I, I I do see things changing. I don't know if you feel that way too. Like, it's, Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, it's getting better. It's not the best, but it is getting no, better. It's getting a lot better. Um, even Which like, uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, which is even why I feel comfortable talking about it right now, mm. you know, like with you, I, I don't think that that would be the case if I hadn't seen so many other people around me take that step and show yeah. me that it was okay. Yeah. Um, you're an American, so uh, you would, you would, you would know about your, you had a uh, Olympic athlete, Simone uh, Biles, right? Who yeah. she, she took time to take care of her mental health. And that was just like, everybody was shocked about it, but very supportive. That yeah. is something that never would have happened like 10 years ago. Exactly. Like to, to, pull, to pull out of the Olympics or a big competition for mental health. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's very – yeah. and another thing that's really interesting just in just as an aside is um, we run two spaces on Twitter. They, they're these audio chat rooms. And uh, a lot of people are openly on spaces, these audio chat rooms where anybody can join. The theme of the room is mental health or come talk about depression or come talk about anxiety. And they're full. They're full of like 50 to 100 people every day, people talking about it. So that's also good to see, like complete strangers. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's really it great is. that you're doing that. Well, not me, not me, but they're, they're other rooms that run that theme. Like oh, other, sorry other that people. you were running these rooms. No, way, no, no, that's cool no, I, <laughs> I, I don't have the, I don't, that's not my background. So I don't want to step into yeah. that realm, but I see it happening and that's, that's great. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that about mental health. That's, I mean, that's a great, great message and good advice. Um, and kind of a nice way to end the, the chat since we're talking about life on other planets, life here on earth can get difficult, but it's mm -hmm. easier if we talk about it. Absolutely. So uh, Daria, where can, since we're at the end of the podcast, can people follow you on social media? Do you have some, some accounts people can check out? I do. So my main, my Twitter is kind of where you're going to get the most science content. My Twitter account is Astro Daria. Um, that one is, I try to keep it updated on uh, things I'm doing, you know, at work. Um, I do have an Instagram account that is planet scientist. Uh, I just post pictures on there. I post a lot of story updates sometimes about cool things I'm doing. I'm trying oh, cool. to, uh, get myself more to utilize my Instagram better over the course of the next few months. So that's hopefully somewhere that you'll see mm -hmm. me, uh, posting a lot more. Well, and that, that's great. I, I, we have a, we have a big, big ish Instagram account, not like Twitter, but I can't figure out Instagram. I have such, I have, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for people that can figure that platform out. <laughs> yeah. It's tough. Cool. Okay. We'll make sure those places to follow you are, uh, are in our show notes. So everybody's just one click away. Um, one Sounds click away from great. Me. This has All been right. an amazing, this has been an amazing chat. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with us about life on other planets. Uh, some some uh, a really a touching pet story and some great advice for mental health. 
Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened in the past one or two weeks, and sometimes Bunsen chimes in. Um, no, he's just being loud right now. Uh, yeah, so on this episode of story time, sorry, I'm petting Bunsen and I'm losing my train of thought. There we go. Okay, so I have a story. Um, and my story involves Bunsen, the big bear. Um, so dad was in his room and then he sneezed out of nowhere. He went, Yachoo! and then he sneezed again. And, went, Yachoo! and then he sneezed for a third time. And, went, and so I'm like, okay, mom, I'm going to pull a prank on him. Yeah, Cause I don't know. I thought it would be funny. And then I, wa- I started sneaking over. Like, like really, really sneaking. Really sneaking, really quiet. And Bunsen really didn't like it. He doesn't like people being suspicious. So he barked at me. He went, Bruh! and then mom screamed. She went, ah! So it ruined my plan of sneaking. Um, I carried through with my prank, though. I went on over to dad's room and I went, Ugh! and it had no effect. So, yeah, Bunsen does not like people being suspicious. He never has. Nope. And he doesn't like suspicious people. Does not like suspicious people at all. But yeah, that's my story. Dad, do you have a story? You bet. We're going to save the juicy story for Pet Chat this Saturday, the really exciting story, um, just just to keep things short. And I'm going to talk about the Melting Creek. So warm, warm weather has rolled through. I think it was 20 degrees today Celsius. Very Woo-hoo, warm. Some yep, I know you're happy, Chris. Yep, the dogs are barking. And, and uh, the snow has melted a lot. Uh, it's all gone in town except for the snow piles by plowing. And we still have snow, lots of snow out here, but it's only on the shady areas of the hills. And the creek has started running again, and it is going bananas, um, and Bunsen refuses to go near it. He does not want to get his paws wet. So normally we might jump across the creek. He doesn't even want to do that anymore. He doesn't even want to look at water. Beaker, on the other hand, is looking at the water, getting close to the water, sometimes going in the water. I actually think it's really cold, but she wants to go in it so bad she does. So on the walks now, she'll like work up the courage to go in the water for a bit um, just to play, just to (laughs) to stick her head under the water and blow bubbles. I need to get that that, on video because it's so funny. Is that hydrophilic and hydrophobic? Pretty much. Bunsen is definitely hydrophobic. Uh, And when he gets wet, he looks weird too. Like he doesn't even look good. Like some wet dogs look good. Bunsen just looks sad and... Like De- and dejected, not fluffy, it's not fluffy. <laughs> so, no, yeah, that's my story. Uh, that reminds me of last year when Beaker went into the water and she looked like a little muskrat. <laughs> and then when Bunsen jumped out of the uh, the sea kayak and then got all wet and started swimming back to shore, <laughs> Bunsen does not like getting wet. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. You may actually right now be, uh, you may actually right now be experiencing what I experience every day that we do spaces. I sit down at my computer and I have my phone out and my mic and I'm getting ready to be part of a very serious space on Tuesday or on Saturday. It's a silly space. And Bunsen, Pavlov's dogs, it doesn't fail. He's all like, talk to me. Talk to me. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk. Bark, bark, bark. Cry, cry, cry. Get me a chew. Get me a Kong. He, it's like he knows. And the other thing that they know is when I am going to read the stories, they know my motions of getting the, (laughs) the phone and my mic and the book. And they're all like prancing going, we're going to get a treat. We're going to get a story. So I have some behavior conditioning happening without actually really trying to get behavior conditioning happening. So that's my story. Yeah, Bunsen's being a really big cuddly bear right now. I sat down with him and he was being cuddly. But yeah, that is story time. Thank you guys for tuning in to the story time. Can't wait to see you on the next podcast. Uh, Bye-bye. Well, that's the end of another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. 
Special thanks to Daria Pitordeski, who talked to us about planetary science. It was so fascinating and out of this world. <laughs> We'd also like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on Patreon. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And all of our patrons get access to the private Twitter account of Bunsen and Beaker now. It's so exciting. All right, Chris, take it away. Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Rater, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Katya Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Leela Periello, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Sports, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashir, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathert. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, <laughs>